there really isn't much to see. On first appearance, the north-central Texas countryside seems nondescript. Some rolling hills dotted with prickly pear and mesquite trees. As you walk this countryside, you become resigned to the reality that this place can never be the way it once was. The clock can't be turned back. This landscape was once teeming with buildings and people, but the slate has been wiped clean for the most part. You have to search out signs of the community that once thrived here. Today, those signs are subtle and are gradually receding into the trees and hills. There is one notable exception, the old power plant smokestack. No matter where you go, it's always on the horizon. At the remains of number 10 mine, the graveyard, or even Big Lake. It's always there, a sort of inscrutable monolith or round obelisk that exerts a strong presence here. And the smokestack is the most tangible object that ties you back to those old days when this ghost town of Thurber was once a bright star rising on the Texas horizon. Red sky of morning, tops New York Hill on a city below. The sidewalks are filled with miners and breakers who will start off the day for a boom town in Texas, 1908. Wake up, Thurber, Texas, there's work to be done. Bring up the coal, we got a railroad to run. I wanna ride the black diamond out to the mine. Wake up, Thurber, Texas, you've fallen behind. Thurber, Texas was a special place. This town was born over a hundred years ago, and it was obliterated almost exactly 50 years later. At one point, more than 10,000 people lived and worked here. The year was 1886. Back in those days, this part of Texas was sparsely populated. Situated here between Fort Worth and Abilene, the nearest town of any size was Stephenville, about 30 miles to the southeast. Most of the people who lived in the area were farmers and ranchers, and the lifestyle was quiet and easygoing. That is, until 1886. It was in that year that William and Harvey Johnson purchased 2,300 acres of the Pedro Herrera Survey in Erath and Palo Pino counties. The Johnsons wanted to get into the coal mining business. Coal was a very hot commodity at this time because of the railroads. The Texas and Pacific Railroad was coming through the region, and their locomotives ran on coal. Now, up until this time, businessmen in neighboring communities had tried to supply the railroad with coal from their mines. But the supply was limited and undependable. In contrast, the Johnson property sat on top of one of the best coal veins in Texas. In fact, it was the only rich burning bituminous type of coal in the entire state, not the typical and vastly inferior lignite coal found elsewhere. The Johnson brothers opened their first mine shaft near the community of Newcastle and had plans for a second mine as well. The main problem facing the two brothers was their lack of money. The venture was undercapitalized and they didn't have sufficient funds to build up a large scale operation. To make matters worse, they encountered severe labor problems with their miners. In September 1888, the Johnsons couldn't pay their men and the workers went out on strike, supported by the Knights of Labor, who were trying to get a union in the mines. The miners and the Johnsons were unable to reach an agreement, and the mines stayed closed. Harvey Johnson died in early 1888, and his surviving brother, William Whipple, decided to cut his losses and sell the mines. In that same month of September 1888, the Johnson Mine property was sold to a group of investors led by Colonel Robert Dickey Hunter of Fort Worth. Among other investors involved were his son-in-law, Edgar Marston, and Horace K. Thurber. 
Johnson agreed to sell to this group because of the strike and a shortage of money. Colonel Hunter had been told about the property a year before by his friend Jay Gould, the famous railroad baron and owner of the Texas and Pacific Railroad. They came from the corners with the tools of their trade. They came to raise coal from the black holes where it lay. They came to build a legend and the legend lives on. They came to build a city 20,000 strong. Wake up, Thurber, Texas, there's work to be done. Bring up... Hunter took control of the property in November 1888. Hunter, Marston, and Thurber named their business the Texas and Pacific Coal Company. Their mining venture was not connected in any way to the Texas and Pacific Railroad, though Hunter may have chosen a name to flatter the railroad, since it was to be his chief customer for coal. Hunter then constructed a town near his mine shafts. The town was named Thurber, in deference to the TMP coal investor. Previously, under the Johnsons, the miners had been receiving $1.95 per ton. Hunter offered to pay the miners $1.45 for each ton of coal they mined. None of the workers took Hunter up on his offer. To keep out the striking miners and union agitators, a fence was strung around the entire town, and at the entrance, a locked gate was put in and posted with a round-the-clock guard. Hunter was a very uh, aggressive person, and uh, everything had to be done his way. And, of course, it was his town, and he was going to run it his way. And, of course, uh, the statement is made, uh, or has been made, uh, attributed to him that he would run his town or run it to hell. When he took over, he knew that the first task, he had to break the back of the union because they were demanding too high a wage and there's no way that his company could prosper. So the miners were mad about this, and they were just mad in general when Hunter took over. So when he came in and tried to institute his policies, then they wouldn't have anything about this, so they threatened his life. Uh, in fact, when he moved in, I think uh, he and his general manager moved to Thurber in December, on December 20, 1888, and immediately somebody fired shots through the office building. Uh, Colonel Hunter had relied on local law enforcement to protect him, protect what he felt was his property, and uh, unfortunately, from Colonel Hunter's standpoint, the sheriff at that time was uh, very close friends with several of the strikers. And so the law enforcement was, in Colonel Hunter's view, maybe a little biased. And he was able to prevail on the county judge to attract the Texas Rangers in. And when they showed up, um, eventually they were able to exert some type or you know, impose a peaceful uh, settlement on, on the community that later became known as Thurber. Hunter refused to allow the strikers through his gates to get to a public road. Order was temporarily restored by the rangers and the mining operation got underway. In June of 1889, Hunter hired a young civil engineer who'd been surveying a proposed railroad line between Thurber and Dublin. William Knox Gordon, a self-taught geologist, quickly rose to superintendent and general manager of the mines due to his innate knowledge of land formations and the ability to gain as well as maintain the admiration and respect of the employees. It was said of the independent young Virginian, show him a ledge of rock in any section of the Thurber Coal Basin and he can tell within a few feet the exact depth from the surface to the coal. Under Gordon, the mine's daily output grew from 50 tons to 3,000 tons. Gordon and Hunter operated the mines for more than 10 years on an open shop basis despite vigorous efforts by the United Mine Workers of America to organize their employees. Hateful, unsigned flyers threatening Hunter began to circulate. Hunter countered with a circular of his own, offering a $200 reward for those responsible. The Texas and Pacific Coal Company ended up getting many of their miners from overseas. Hundreds of immigrants from close to 20 countries were recruited to come to Thurber. These immigrants were willing to work for Hunter's wages, and many of them were already experienced miners in their native lands. 
These immigrants ended up working for less than the offered $1.45 per ton. Part of what they mined was considered scrap or reject coal, so about 15% of every ton they mined was not accepted. This pea or scrap coal was a major bone of contention between the company and the workers. The workers were angry because the company said the pea coal was too inferior to sell to the railroads. The company did use this coal to fuel the furnaces in their brickworks. The miners were lucky if they got one dollar per ton. T and P coal continued to import men, and by the fall of 1889, the striking miners realized their position was hopeless and called off their strike. Those who did work for T and P coal faced conditions that were difficult and confining, but few of the immigrants complained. Both Mary Outa Franks and her son-in-law, Johnny Biondini, grew up in Thurber. Their parents came here from Italy right around the turn of the century. Dad and them was in pretty bad shape there in Italy. In fact, uh, most of the immigrants there had in mind to come to Thurber and, and make this money, send it back to Italy, and then move back to Italy. But very few of them moved back. After they got here, their quality of life was so much better than it was there. They stayed here. Some days he'd make a dollar and a half, that was a lot of money for him, and some days he'd just make a dollar. But we, that was a lot better than he had in Italy. And the company was real nice to him. They brought him here, and after he was here three or four months, well, they paid my mother's fare from Italy. None of them people really, you know, really complained then, because you know, that's where they made a living. I guess it's hard work and had to take a lot of stuff. You know? A lot of them had sores, you know, on them, where they would be laying on that hard, well, it wasn't ground, it actually was shale that they were laying on, you know, and of course it was rough. And a lot of times they would have sores, they'd have to put padding on different parts of their arms and legs. Mama used to make pads for Papa's shoulders and his knees and his hips. <laughs> Employees were issued script, or tickets such as these that they could use in the company's retail stores. The script could only be used in Thurber, and was worthless outside the town. They had real nice stores. For that, for that time, I imagine they had the best. I would say Thurber had the best store in the country. The, uh, the dry goods store there at Thurber, it included everything. Then it, yeah, they took care of the dead dead people and then had the funeral yeah, the service. Store, yeah, that was for the morgue and everything. Everything was all under that one yeah. roof yeah. there. They, uh, from cradle to grave. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they'd treat you pretty good, but there was no, it was their price and that was it. Because there was no other stores there. You, nobody could go in. There was fence. When my mom and dad come, first come to Thurber, they were kind of fenced in. They didn't, nobody could go in there. In other words, you had company money, you know, and then yeah. you had to spend it there. So you didn't have much choice, and, you know, you, you, you nearly had to buy there whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> With the spirit of an explorer, Superintendent Gordon spent many hours walking the rugged countryside around Thurber. He noticed a clay mud that stuck to his boots following one soggy hike and decided to test it for its brick-making possibilities. This shale clay would become Thurber's second biggest industry. In March 1897, Colonel Hunter started the Green and Hunter Brick Company with $100,000 capital. Thurber uh, made millions of bricks. This fireplace is made out of 35 different types of Thurber bricks. The uh, most common brick made in the Thurber brick plant was what we call pavers. The Shale for the bricks came from what was known as Steam Shovel Mountain, or sometimes called Shale Pit Mountain. It was transported by cars to the uh, brick plant. It was crushed up there, mixed with water, and uh, cut into bricks with wire cutters, then placed in the kills and cooked at a very high temperature. They used coal up until about uh, 1917, and then uh, gas from the X-ray field fired the uh, brick kills. Uh, the most uh, predominant brick, of course, was the pavers. 
And this paved uh, Congress Avenue, Galveston Seawall, the streets of Fort Worth, uh, many places throughout Texas, and particularly the highways. After America started traveling after World War I, the uh, brick pavers were used extensively in paving the highways. The uh, uh, Thurber brick was uh, very good. It was high quality. Uh, right here, these are called tumblers, this brick and this brick. When they made a batch of brick, they took the brick and put it in a tumbling machine, which tumbled the thing around for uh, so many times to see how it withstood. And it's, it's sort of uh, uh, smooth and rounded, but the uh, bricks were uh, very high quality, particularly the paving brick, which are still in many of the streets after 60 or 70 years. Built streets paved of brick, built churches and schools, built horseshoe saloons, and then they filled them with fools. Who worked for the company that paid them no more? What they could spend at their company's store. Wake up One of Gordon's toughest tests as supervisor came in September 1903, when many of the miners struck for higher pay. For 15 years, TNP Coal had been able to keep union organizers out of Thurber, but finally one had managed to slip in. After negotiations with a union in Fort Worth, TMP's Edgar Marston and Gordon agreed to a 35% pay raise, an eight-hour workday, and union recognition in Thurber. The mining camps at Thurber were just uh, one of several mine operations in north central Texas at that time. And so when representatives of the United Mine Workers met with management, in a sense, it was a regional meeting. All the mines were represented, all the management, and then all the workers. The Thurber was a significant plum, and if concessions could be obtained from the management at Thurber, then all the rest of the mines would follow suit. And in fact, that's very much what happened. Thurber became then a completely unionized town. Now, this would include not just the miners, but then all the people who performed labor of some type in Thurber. The statement was made uh, by 1907 that Thurber was the most completely union town in the United States. Well, there was another saying that circulated that, at that time, and that was that everybody who lived in Thurber was a member of the union, or if they weren't, they were a new arrival in town and their application was pending. Well, after the strike in 1903, the union symbol was imprinted on every brick made in Thurber. Now any brick that does not have that union symbol, that triangle, that means it was made prior to 1903. And after the strike, uh, then of course conditions improved in the mines and uh, they were relatively free from strikes for years and years. Finally reached a, a peak in coal production, I think about 1915. A look at a T&P coal company ledger book gives a good idea of what the miners made and how much was taken out of their paycheck every month. Each coal miner paid so much of his, you know, salary each month for doctors, for the, him and the whole family. Rent, lights, that's what the company took for the house rent where we lived. And then they took out for the lights, train. Well, they charged the coal miners to go from the from town to the coal mine and back, over in the morning, back in the evening on the train. They had the mining cars, what they're going right in. We moved into a company house, and uh, we paid $13 a month for everything. That was the rent, the water, the gas, and the, and the electricity. Now that was, that covered it all. And if we wanted anything, even a chicken coop, well, they, we'd have to get the company, they'd build it for us, but we didn't own it. And uh, it was just unusual in the fact that they owned everything in the town. Thurber was a uh, 
a very advanced town for its time and in its age and also in its area. Thurber was a very, very urban community in a state that was largely rural and agrarian at that time. Thurber enjoyed a lot of amenities that even um, incorporated towns often did not have. The money or profits that were made from the coal mines, uh, the flow of cash from the coal mines, was often used to improve the town in many different ways. If you were in Thurber, even at an early age, you had water available to you in the house. You had electricity available to you in the house. Even as uh, early as 1915, you had gas piped to you in the house. Also, uh, there were attempts made to have Thurber become a self-sufficient community. And these were very extensive attempts. These were things like to operate a dairy farm or to raise feed for the animals. Sometimes early on it worked in the mines, but then also the dairy cattle. There were farms around Thurber that supplied the produce. There was, of course, the main mercantile outlet that at first served primarily as a, as a store, a company-owned store to benefit the miners. But then later, after the turn of the century, became more or less a retail uh, outlet for the region as well. There were uh, dry goods stores, butcher market, they raised their own cattle. It was really a very far-sighted uh, undertaking. There were uh, several attempts of these kind that would make Thurber, at least at the turn of the century, a very attractive place to live. With close to 20 different nationalities all coexisting in this company town, Thurber really was an ethnic smorgasbord. It was just like one big family. And when someone had trouble, well, everybody had trouble. Everybody tried to help them uh, as a family. The, uh, everybody enjoyed each other. Most of the immigrants, first of all, want to be good Americans. So uh, they still retain their ethnic identity, but there was absolutely no conflict. And in many instances, uh, uh, one ethnic group would join in the uh, celebration of another ethnic group. And there was always something going on. Of course, the Italians were in the majority, and they were very lively, animated, and uh, they were always singing, loved music, and uh, they liked uh, good food. One part of Italy may cook one way, and the other come the other way, and then borders usually move where they where they come closest to the one that was in Italy, cooked their way. Much of the baking done by the Italians was in homemade brick ovens. They made out of, most of we had in Angus was made out of clay. Those get clay and wet it, stick the brick together with that, you know. Kind of arc it around, made a, like a, oh, uh, Eskimo gigloo, you know, that's the way it was made to top. Sometimes he put 10 or 12 loaves of bread in there, all depend on how big, how much bread you want to bake. Mary Outta Franks grew up in her mother's boarding house that catered mostly to the Italian miners. The highest my mother ever charged them was $18 a month, but the, for years and years, they'd only go from eight to $10 a month, and that included everything, their bedding, their shoe shining, and <laughs> cooking, make their lunch, buckets, they, they, their bucket, their lunch was in buckets. You, they had to have buckets to go to the mine. It didn't take much to make a celebration, for example, a baptism or a wedding or uh, even a funeral would end up being celebrated, uh, maybe two or three days. When we had Weekend dances, like I say, we'd clear off the dining room and then play and dance. We didn't have to hire no music. We they all and of a night you could sit out there and just hear music all over there. They all was playing and happy. They'd even dance out on the ground, out in the open there in the summertime when the weather was pretty. We had arbors up out there, you know. That was their air conditioners. <laughs> At uh, New Year's, frequently, the Italians would put dynamite on fence posts and at midnight blast off with the dynamite, rattle all the windows. They all drank their beer, though. We always had keg beer. 
And lots of times, as one of my boarders said, Mary says, you get up and, and pass the beer around, says, I'll give you a quarter. And you'd think I wouldn't take that quarter. <laughs> After a hard day in the mines, many of the men often headed straight for one of the company saloons. Drinking and conversation were popular pastimes in Thurber. So popular that the company had a standing agreement with a Fort Worth brewery to trade a trainload car of coal for a carload of beer every week. These saloons were the man's domain and women were not welcome. Of course, the uh, company uh, had their own saloon, had two saloons, the Snake and the Lizard. And when Erath County went dry in 1904, they just moved the Snake Saloon just inside Pelopino County, which was like maybe a quarter of a mile from downtown Thurber, and they set up operation there. This was uh, really a big business because uh, the miners really loved their drink, and there was always uh, uh, plenty of wine and beer, which the company uh, provided. A lot of people used to go to the saloon, you know, and, and get their beer in the buckets and then bring it home and drink it. Some Italians made their own home brew. They made grapple out of pure raisins, a hundred and something proof all that. The idea of that was a lot of them come in and buy the, buy the gallon and take it home, split it in half, and make two gallons. During Prohibition, some Italians in Thurber Junction, or Mingus as it's called today, were active on the bootlegging scene. Because of the town's reputation, many a home was searched by federal agents. Hey, I know they come by here one day. I just got from school. I seen the search warrant in the cabinet. I reached in and get me a plate to eat, and the search warrant fell out. I said, uh oh, the boy's been here. The county is one you had to watch for, because they they sent you to Huntsville. Catch your bootleg in Huntsville and catch you killing somebody gave you suspended sentence. I live, an old lady lived over, my brother-in-law lived in the old house. They sent her to Huntsville for a year and a day. She was 75 years old. Because of its size, there was often lots to do in Thurber. One of the highlights every week was the Sunday concert at the bandstand in Pavilion on the east side of town. People usually swarm there on Sunday night. For that. They'd give band concerts, you know. And then they'd give you a check, go to the drugstore, get something to drink if you belong to the band. The Italian band was considered the best, and it was often asked to play at cities outside of Thurber, including the Dallas State Fair and the Fort Worth Stock Show. The band got its start when the company brass first began coming to town on their railroad cars. A volunteer group of musicians was assembled, and the men struck up a song as soon as the executives rolled into town. The company was so pleased with the reception that they gave the band two sets of uniforms, red and white. Perhaps the pride and joy of Thurber's social life was the town's impressive opera house. Because of the large Italian population, opera was extremely popular in Thurber. Built in 1895 and capable of seating more than 650 people, the facility was host to some of the premier touring shows of the time. The building had steam heat for the winter and electric ceiling fans for the summer. Company brass and VIPs had their own private balcony boxes. The traveling shows would pull their railroad cars right into town and unload next to the opera house. The company would also show movies several times a week, and once or twice a year, circuses and carnivals would come to town. Although you couldn't hardly get through town or anywhere else when Labor Day got there, the big uh, fair would come in, the circus and the side shows and everything that they'd have that would come in, and then all oh, those headless women and fat women and. Most all, the, like the old sideshows used to be, some of them wasn't true, some of them was. Some of them were more, just they just made freaks out of a lot of people. And they'd serve free, had big barrels of water with cups all tied all around them. And anybody could go by and get a drink. They never thought about anybody else drinking after them like they do nowadays. They just didn't, they just went ahead and got them a drink and went on. 
On some of the big holidays, like Labor Day and the 4th of July, there would be a parade through Thurber. The unions, clubs, and various organizations would sponsor lavish floats, and the citizens would provide a strong turnout. On Labor Day 1918, the first airplane to visit Thurber landed on Cemetery Hill. Everybody was, I think, scared to death when they saw it coming up there. Of course, we all run up there to see what was going on. It was during one of the uh, Labor Day picnics, and everybody run up there to see what was going on. I think they thought it was going to leave before we all got up there. The men in Thurber also had another social outlet. There were various men's organizations in town, including the Woodmen of the World and the Red Man Lodge. We had more churches in that little town than you could imagine. We had one for every nationality nearly that they wanted to go to, you see. And then we had the Negra Church. And that Negra Church was something else. You could hear it all over town when they had a revival, you see. The community boasted a public school, parochial Catholic school, and Colonel Hunter's namesake, Hunter Academy. For recreation, the Italians loved to play bocce ball, which is similar to lawn bowling. The winner was the one who could bowl closest to the bling, or target ball. Thurber also had several excellent baseball teams that were well supported by the entire community. I know John, my husband, he played in the ball team at uh, Thurber, and they would go to Fort Worth and Dallas, they'd go several places and play, and they won first place lots of times. They'd give them a prize, a shirt or something, you know, and they'd, they'd go. A social highlight for many men in Thurber was a legendary badger fight, staged mainly at the expense of Yankee visitors. This sporting event usually took place when Colonel Hunter's son-in-law, Edgar Marston, came down to Thurber from New York. Marston would usually bring a northern guest with him. The guest would be filled with news of this fantastic badger fight all the way down to Thurber, so that by the time he got here, he was quite excited with anticipation. In one corner would be a huge dog roped to a stake, straining at his collar. In the other corner, inside a barrel, was the mysterious opponent, the wild and fierce badger. The guest of honor would be asked to release the badger for the start of the fight. Finally, with a vigorous effort, he would pull on the rope. But much to his surprise and embarrassment, what came out of the barrel was not a ferocious badger, but a chamber pot or commode dish. <laughs> From 1903 to 1920, Thurber was a prosperous, bustling boom town. Coal production reached its peak in 1915, and at that time the population numbered close to 10,000. Many of the managerial and office employees lived in the most fashionable part of town known as New York Hill or Silk Stocking Row. This location overlooked Little Lake and the town of Thurber. Nearby was the exclusive Hunter Club, named after the Colonel and later called the Thurber Club. This hunting and fishing resort was on the banks of Big Lake. Wake up! I want to stand in your streets and relive your boat. Wake up, Herbert, Texas, won't you play W.K. Gordon knew the key to the company's survival was diversification. Under his supervision, the coal company began prospecting for oil in 1912. He was convinced that large quantities of oil lay below the surface despite reports to the contrary by trained geologists. 300,000 acres of land were leased in the surrounding counties for drilling. Though Gordon successfully brought in a number of shallow wells, he was determined that much more oil lay deeper beneath the surface. He finally won approval from the company to drill a deep well on the John McCleskey farm in Ranger, some 20 miles to the west of Thurber. 
Mounting expenses almost shut down the operation, but Gordon persisted. The hole went deeper and deeper, and finally on October 17, 1917, the drilling crew hit oil, and the TP Coal Company had a wild gusher on its hands. Gordon's son, W.K. Gordon Jr., remembers that day in October 1917 when his father received news of the McCleskey gusher. Well, all I remember is that uh, I was with my father as I was quite often. I was a child. I was just seven years old, but he used to take me when he'd go out looking at country, prospecting and all. We'd been up in the area of Breckenridge and Caddo this particular day, and we stopped. Uh, he was going to let me go there and try to hunt for some squirrel down on the creek with this gun I had. And we got out of the car and walked down the creek for a while. I don't think we had any luck finding any squirrels at all, but we got back to the car and there was this note on the steering wheel from John Ely, who was one of Mr. Gordon's assistants, saying the McCluskey well is blown in. He was just very satisfied, I think, and smiled. I don't think he had any, ever had any kind of jumping up and down reactions to anything. He was very calm. The McCluskey well ushered in the start of the famous Ranger oil boom. During the next three years, this field would produce more than 20 million barrels of oil. And in fact, the McCleskey discovery, which generally opened the Ranger field, uh, is significant for that reason. It was a confirmation that deep-lying oil existed and that this uh, deep oil had no, uh, left no type of indication on the surface. Uh, now, it took two years or better after 1917 for people to unravel the geological puzzle of North Texas. And yet Mr. Gordon had had an insight into that at a very early date. And uh, his, his faith, his, uh, his initiative is really what brought into play the great North Texas oil boom of, of 1917 to 1919. The company quickly amended its name to the Texas and Pacific Coal and Oil Company. The McCleskey discovery had come none too soon. It enabled the company to switch products without missing a beat, but it also was the death knell for Thurber. Starting in the teens, the railroads had gradually started switching to a new fuel supply, oil. Towards the end of the second decade, the demand for coal had dropped markedly. Sporadic mining was attempted over the next decade, but for all intents and purposes, the Thurber mining boom had crashed to a halt. Over the years, the company had mined 14 million tons of coal. 160 million tons still lay underground. The miners probably didn't uh, realize the seriousness of the situation, and they struck in 1921 for higher wages, and this was an opportunity for the company then just to shut the mines out, shut them out, close the town down completely. The company there carried the employees well, I don't know, months and months, let them have groceries and water and gas and everything. The people didn't suffer there. They had credit there, and the company bound to have lost millions, I wouldn't say millions, of thousands and thousands of dollars there because the employees was out of work there so long, a lot of them couldn't possibly pay, but the company continued to feed them. The uh, brick plant contained an operation because they're still building a lot of highways, but there were absolutely uh, no demand for the miners. So you had uh, all these miners out of work, so the company just gave them notice to vacate the company towns. And so just north of Thurber, about uh, a half a mile, they set up what was known as Tent City. The uh, union provided tents and uh, many of the families had to move in tents in an open field there for uh, several months until they uh, could relocate or move on. And of course, then those that had a large family and owned their own home in Thurber Junction, uh, there's no way they could move on, so these people uh, generally turned to bootlegging. In 1930, a fire swept through the downtown area, burning many buildings. In the same year, the brick plant was closed. Three years later, T&P Coal and Oil moved its headquarters to Fort Worth. The coal part was dropped from the company name, and it became the Texas and Pacific Oil Company. In 1936, the town was leveled for the most part. 
I had hopes of it maybe coming back sometime, but then I could see that it wasn't. It just couldn't be saved because there were just too many things already gone, and it was a company town, and they were determined to dispose of it, and they did. Salvage crews stripped anything of value. All the smokestacks except one were dynamited, and the buildings were knocked over. The company had obliterated its own town. I loved the town, hated to see it uh, have to disappear, but I could understand why, of course. I really like it much better now than I did for a few years when there were all those vacant houses and buildings there. That, that used to really depress me when I'd drive and all see these buildings all with the windows broken out and the doors broken out and all, all these hills with just hundreds of ex-homes on them that were just going to rack and ruin. It broke your heart, of course, to see the town just move off because they sold those big houses there, those frame houses there in town, hundreds of them sold for $40 a piece. There is uh, something about all these events in that they help create community in a place like Thurber. And the fascinating thing is, particularly when we look at community now, so many of us who live in urban areas may not even know our neighbors or speak to them. And yet at Thurber, once a year, you have people come from all across the nation and gather in this one spot and reenact community. They have a greater and a closer bond many times than, than we do. And yet their community physically exists no more whereas ours, ours are still very much a part of our life. Sometimes it makes you feel kind of sad <clears throat> knowing that all of the city that you was born and practically raised in is gone. Of course, your parents are all gone. Families, what you did have, moved out of here, and it, it, it makes you feel sad. But I guess we should be thankful for what we got out of it by <clears throat> our parents moving from Italy and naturally having a whole lot better life here, so... I feel like we have to, we do have something to be thankful for. Then came the day of the ill winds of change. Nothing to lose, nothing to gain. The miners walked out to never return. There's a fire in the city, just let it burn. Texas, all out of time. Bring down the houses, and shut down the mine. They've struck oil and ranger, and there's more to be found. Hey, Thurber, Texas, you're bound to go down. Red sky of morning tops New York Hill on a city below sleep silent and still your sidewalks have buckled the streets with no names empty hotel rooms for all that remain Anchor, Texas I can't hear your song from the old Opry house that's now we don't need your coal and your railroad don't run. So sleep Thurber, Texas. I guess you work is all.